still, there are places where brain science really does add particular value. And in my own view, as I've said before, I think one of the particular areas where it adds a special value is drawing our attention back to the fundamental processes of learning, the how of personal growth altogether. And uh, for growing, inner strengths, very broadly defined. Inner strengths like mindfulness, the strengths that enable us to simply be with our experience, to bear our own pain without trying to change one whit of it, to feel our feelings, to step back from our experience and disidentify from it, simply to witness it. It takes strengths inside, various capabilities such as distress tolerance or steadiness of mind or an internalized sense of allies to be able to just simply be with our own experience. You know, as they say in Alcoholics Anonymous, the mind is a dangerous neighborhood. Never go in alone, right? <laughs> and so we've got to internalize strengths to just be with our experience. We also need to internalize strengths to do, in my view, the second of the three great ways to engage the mind, uh, to release the negative, you know, to let the feelings drain out of the body, to challenge negative cognitions, to uh, control or ultimately release unwholesome desires. You know, again, we need strengths to let go. And, of course, through the gradual cultivation of strengths, growing the positive inside ourselves, we grow the flowers we want to have in the inner garden of the mind. Now, as a framework here, I think there are these three great ways to engage the mind, to practice, to let be, let go, and let in. I'm going to focus momentarily on letting in in this larger context, but I think it's important to appreciate the fact that even if, when we're, even if we're moving into choiceless awareness, you know, I'm a long-time meditator, meditation teacher, even moving into some kind of profound state of just simply being with what's there, we also need to have internalized various capabilities that can enable us to do that thing. Okay. So, in this context, then, of talking about inner strengths, I'd like to start with a story I heard about two wolves. And you may have heard this story yourself, or perhaps heard it in different ways. Uh, the way I heard it was this. Uh, a woman was asked toward the end of her life, a Native American First People woman, Grandmother, how did you become so happy? How did you become so wise, so effective? Everybody listens to you, everybody wants to be your friend. How did you actually do it? She paused, she reflected, and she said, you know, I think it's because when I was young, I realized that in my heart were two wolves, one of love and one of hate. And I also realized when I was young that everything depended upon which one I fed each day. I've told that story so often, I'm still getting the shivers every time, you know. The first part, of course, the reality of the wolf of hate. Metaphorically speaking, broadly defined, but that capacity in almost every human heart, certainly inside my own, for ill will, uh, uh, envy, uh, vengeance, even violence, that capacity, rage, if you will. Um, and the second takeaway here, which is really relevant for our purposes, is this fundamental idea that we're continually feeding one wolf or another. The brain is continually changing based on our experiences, one way or another. Which wolf will we feed? Will we feed the wolf of love? Will we grow love in our heart? Or other forms of inner strength, right? Inner strengths are a very familiar idea in psychology, uh, as well as in the culture altogether. Uh, love, obviously, is an inner strength, uh, as are various capabilities, like the executive functions, mindfulness, impulse control. Uh, inner strengths include positive emotions, as Barbara Fredrickson. I'm really looking forward to her presentation. Uh, and her colleagues have uh, so well documented uh, positive emotion, happiness, joy. You know, California has no monopoly on positive emotion. Gratitude, gladness, uh, awe, uh, everyday sense of well-being, accomplishment. These positive emotions, um, besides being pleasant in the moment, uh, confer all kinds of value for people. They make people stronger. They make them more resilient. They make people more able to handle the hard things in life. Also, of course, inner strengths include various attitudes like openness or determination, uh, you know, an approach orientation, optimism, uh, somatic inclinations, as Peter Levine uh, just 
blew my mind at his lunch address yesterday, talking about inclinations in the body, vitality, relaxation, leaning in rather than back. You know, I learned a while ago with my wife of 31 years that when she had a problem and more and more it was looking like it was me, that it was better to lean forward in the listening moment rather than lean away, you know, <laughs> kind of got, kept my head in the game, you know. That's a somatic inclination too, right? Okay. And then last, of course, the character virtues of all kinds, patience, generosity, thrift. Uh, I forget all the Boy Scout character virtues I was supposed to memorize. Thrift, something like that. Cleanliness was in there, I think, somewhere. I dispense with that quickly. Wisdom and so on. Okay, so what does it actually take to develop these inner strengths? Well, inner strengths in the modern neuropsychological frame, the natural frame, are understood to be built out of brain structure. Okay, so then the question becomes, very pragmatically, how do we get that good stuff into the brain? Inner strengths are grown in this two-stage process where essentially we have an experience of them or a related factor, that's a state, which then gets installed in the brain increasingly as a trait. We move essentially from mental states, thoughts, feelings, inclinations, states of mind, emotions, body states, and so forth. We move from states, mental states, to neural traits from activation to installation, from short-term memory buffers to long-term storage. We grow inner strengths, in, in short, by experiencing them or related factors and then helping those experiences sink in and gradually weave their way into the fabric of the brain and therefore our life. For example, a child comes to feel securely attached by repeatedly internalizing, installing, experiences of feeling seen, valued, responded to, cherished and prized. An adult, let's say, gradually grows compassion inside herself or himself by repeatedly internalizing, installing, experiences of empathy, um, kindness, uh, a sense of what it's like uh, to walk in other, another person's shoes, uh, the intention, the, the wish that beings not suffer, uh, warm-heartedness of various kinds. Or let's say an adult might uh, develop more sense of confidence at work by repeatedly uh, internalizing, installing experiences of uh, accomplishment, of feeling valued by other people, uh, rec of having a sense of the goodness inside that one's own heart. All right? These are the ways in which we grow the good stuff inside ourselves.